get there. Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16, I would love to say I found it. I did not. It ticks me off that someone else found it. Because, <laughs> you know, no pride at all in there. Um, I did check it. I found two or three different websites that say how many times a word shows up in each book, not just the standard one of, you know, old, the Bible or the Old Testament or New Testament. And they all agreed how many times the word Lord showed up from Genesis through the end of Numbers. Um, so then I, st I started from there in Deuteronomy and counted, because I don't trust the, the programmers, because I don't know them. Uh, I mean, I know trust the one who sh showed it to me, but he didn't write the program. Um, and it comes out, it, it came out. So in Deuteronomy 16, 11, and thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God. That word Lord, if you don't count apostrophe S, yes, all right, just Lord, capitals, not capitals, whatever. That is the 1611th time the word Lord shows up in your Bible. And it just happens to be in Deuteronomy 16, 11. And read down what the verse says. Oh, and by the way, Lord is the seventh word of the verse. Thy God, thou and thy son, thy daughter, and thy manservant, thy maidservant, and the Levite that is within thy gates, and the stranger that, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you, in the place where it's the Lord, 49th verse, word in the verse, um, seven times seven, in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. So not only is it in chapter 16, verse 11, um, but it's in a verse that talks about God chose to put his name here. Uh, there are only 27 books that have a chapter 16, verse 11. And almost all the 1611 verses only have words like of, uh, the. There's only a few words that have significance like um, Lord and God and Son and things like that. So it's, it's kind of cool. Um, so Zephaniah chapter number one. While you're turning there, in Luke 3, you have the uh, genealogy of Jesus through Mary to Adam. And it says, which is the son of Seth, which is the son of God, which is uh, Adam, which is the son of God. So God is generation number one, Adam's number two. And you get to Jesus Christ, who is generation 77, just by coincidence. 1 John 5, 7, where there are three that bear record. In heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Just by coincidence, if you give two, it's the most attacked verse in the Bible as far as should it be there or not. Uh, and uh, if you give two words to each member of the Godhead, the Father, the Word, Holy Ghost, and how many times those appear uh, adds up to uh, 777 times. So yeah, just by coincidence, you know. Yeah, always is. <clears throat> right, Zephaniah chapter 1. The word of the Lord, which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the day of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place, and the name of the Kemarims with the priests, and them that worship the host of heaven upon the host housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malcolm, and them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests, and it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate and an howling from the second and a great crashing from the hills. Howl, ye inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant 
people are cut down, all they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. You know, God has nothing to do with what goes on here, you know. Therefore their goods shall be a, become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build, them, build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry bitterly. The day is, th that day is a day of wrath, a day of dis trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of thick clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. If you think you're going through most of the tribulation, uh, supposedly that's the day you're looking forward to. Uh, and their the excuse is, well, we're on the right side. Uh, okay, well, it says woe unto them. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that when we get there, cross-reference, but woe unto them that uh, desire the day of the Lord. Uh, verse 17, And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither... Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Paul, would you open in prayer, please? Amen. Thank you. So obviously we saw the day of the Lord several times in chapter 1. Um, I thought about coming and writing it on the board, except you wouldn't be able to even see the You wouldn't even be able to figure out the line was a line, let alone figure it out what I wrote. <laughs> um, but if you just think of time, and if, if uh, the middle of his nose is the cross, all right, and we're, we're out here in roughly 2000 AD, a little more obviously, and uh, back here is 606 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar invades. And Zephaniah writes a little before that. And his writings are predicting Nebuchadnezzar coming here. But the day of, it's also predicting the day of the Lord at the second coming right out here in the Battle of Armageddon. Now the day of the Lord in the Bible can refer to pictures of that day like Sennacherib's invasion of Israel. Um, and... In 2 Peter 3, it seems to engulf, include the whole millennium. Uh, but it's not normally used that way, because obviously this description of the day of the Lord doesn't match most of the millennium. The millennium's a great, a great time to be in. Um, and I, I haven't sorted that out. But we'll, we'll look at the day of the Lord a little bit today, if we get there, um, and then more toward the end of the chapter. So we finished uh, in verse 3, uh, last time and in verse 4 it says I will stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem Deuteronomy 28 it's a strange verse to me I know God said that he set up blessings and curses for Israel and if they would do what God said he would give them all these blessings that all the prosperity gospel preachers go to uh, and other verses in Psalms and try to apply and steal those promises to Israel to us today. It's like uh, Brother Dave said a week, sometime in the last week or so, when you have false doctrine, other than stuff like Jesus isn't, the, isn't God, you know, deity of Christ, a few things like that. But generally, false doctrines are true somewhere in the Bible, just aimed at the wrong person, the wrong people, the wrong time, and, um, and so on. And... So, yeah, God did promise those people those things, but he didn't promise us those things. But this one's a little odd to me. Uh, it just shows I still don't really understand God, or even when something like this reminds me of his character, I kind of drift away and get the little vacation Bible school approach to him. Um, you know, for the seven-year-olds. But in Deuteronomy 28, verse 63, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass... And this is part of the curse side, if they rebel against him. 
And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you. I understand he was going to send judgment, but he's actually going to rejoice in doing so. I just, you know, God's not who I want him to be, which is a good thing, because uh, I'm not holy enough and understanding enough and wise enough, but he is, he's who he is. You know, and that shouldn't surprise us. Nobody is who you want him to be 100%. You know? So why would you think God is? You know? Uh, they're, they're who they are. And with humans, it's some of their faults, and maybe they're envious of their strengths, too. You know, maybe, everything you don't like about somebody is not some, necessarily something that's a flaw in their character. That probably has something to do with it, because, you know, you want to get along, and all, you know, you want everybody to do what you want them to do, you know. But sometimes they can be doing, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. You just don't like it. Maybe you're envious. Maybe, you know, maybe they got a job that you wanted, you know, so, something like that. Um, in God's case, we just don't comprehend them. And even when we see it, we're like, oh. And then we go seem to, okay, I, as Brother Brown would say, okay, you don't, I tend to drift back to making him like I, I want him to be. Right. Um, but he says, I will rejoice over you to destroy you. By the way, he also rejoices to restore them. Yes. And to bring you to, to naught, and you shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Um, but, lest anybody think which, and it may seem obvious, except that most of Christianity... Uh, doesn't believe this, but it, God's not all done with them. Uh, two very familiar passage, Romans 11, 2 says, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Why ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession, intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they, they seek my life. And then down in verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant, and there it is again, something that people are ignorant of, that God says don't, he doesn't want them to be. Of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. So he is going to destroy them, but not utterly. He's going to restore them later. Uh, back in Je Zephaniah 1, verse 4, And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place, in the name of the Cameroons with the priests. Now, uh, hold your finger here. Go to 2 Kings, chapter 23. Second Kings 23. The Cameroons, I'm told by Hebrew definition, but also just historically, uh, they're idolatrous, idolatrous priests. They're priests that, of idols. In 2 Chronicles 23, in verse number 5, and a third part of the house shall be the king's house. That's not what I want. What do I want? 23.5. Am I looking? Oh, I'm in Chronicles. Second Kings. I went to Second Chronicles. I'm like, man, it, I'm like, every time I've looked at it, it didn't say that. <laughs> Why? Who, someone changed my Bible. It, has nothing, it couldn't be that I went to the wrong place. I'm like, wow, what is, what is they talking about? <laughs> Keeps you humble. Um, so, 2 Kings 23, 5. Thank you for whoever pointed it out. I didn't even think about it. Whoa, whoa. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and the places round about Jerusalem and also them that burn, also, uh, uh, them also that burn incense unto Baal and to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and all the host of heaven. So here we are. This is Josiah's reform, uh, which put things off for a little while. Um, 
But then whenever he goes away or Hezekiah goes away, all those things come right back. Why, you know, why, why is it God still judged Israel even though you had these repentances and revi Those things only happened because the king, the king got right with God. The people still had a heart to go back to idols. And as soon as those kings die, just like when Moses died, or jo uh, Joshua died, they would go after other gods. And notice Baal and the sun, the moon, the planets, and all the host of heaven... And that's what's going on in Zephaniah 1. That's, that's why if you're looking, you don't have to learn Hebrew and you don't have to rely on history. Um, you know, okay, whatever, but you just see the, here we are, this is a cross-reference in Zephaniah 1, verses 4 and 5. I'll cut off the rhyme of Baal. The Kemrims with the priests. The priests would be, if we continued in reading in 2 Kings, um, that, would, that would be the, the, the Levite priests. And them that worship the host of heaven and the housetop, and them that worship that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm. So this is a cross reference. So who's left? And you got Baal, you got Baal, you got all the hosts of heaven, you got all the hosts of heaven. You got idolatrous priests, you have Kemerims. All right, so the Bible defines Kemerims as idolatrous priests. All right. Um, and, and I only mention the others because that's what people will go to. And I, wanted, and I just wanted to point out, you don't have to do that. If something matches from history, great. I, you know, if it just, I don't need history to, to even increase my faith in the Bible. It's just cool when it matches. Um, it, 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 just, it just shows you the Bible is real. But God puts that in there and so here, I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll just interpret it for you. Uh, so why is it that he's going to, in verse 5, them that swear by the Lord. What's wrong? Them that worship and swear by the Lord. What's wrong with that? Well, it's because they, the Lord's just, he's just one of them. They also worship Malcolm. They also worship, you know, sun, moon, and stars. They also worship Baal. You know, God's just one of them. He's like in Acts 17. He's the unknown God. But we also worship Jupiter and Diana and, you know, Mercurius and whomever. Zeus, Apollo, you know, and so on. Hey, yo, Pablo, how you doing? <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> so God's going to wipe them all off because God wants to be the only God. He's a jealous God. His name is Jealous with a capital J. Pe I, people say, uh, well, oh, he's just jealous. I, that's not a good quality. That's one of those things. You ever notice those? If you haven't noticed, just start paying attention to it. Words that... The way we use them today are not the way you use them in the Bible, but it's not simply because the English language has changed. There, if you look at the pattern of words that, which words change, it, there's a spirit behind that because it, it's, it always discredits the Bible. Either it makes people say, oh, well, we can't understand that, or that's not what it means, that's a mistranslation. No, it's not a mistranslation. You know, Prevent in you know we we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them asleep which are uh, which are asleep. Oh, that's mistranslation. Should be precede. No, learn English. Prevent meant to pre-event. Uh, it actually has precede and some other things. It's a richer word that has some other things uh, meanings when you when you in in different contexts. Um, but it's the same. Uh, what was the word I was just talking about? What's that? Yeah, no, but what word was I talking about? Jealous. Jealous, thank you. All right. <laughs> it's, it's a, yeah, so mind is a terrible thing. Um, so people today think, including Christians, jealous and envy are, are synonymous. I, I thought that for a long time. And then you start looking at how the Bible uses it because I got asked one time by a teenager years ago about that, about well, why is God jealous? So jealous, jealousy is, is something that is rightfully belongs to me. All right? you, I, have a, I have a right to be jealous over my wife. She doesn't have a right to go to some guy to Maui for the week. And she has a right to expect I'm not going to do something like that because I belong to her. 
1 Corinthians 7 says, let every man have his own wife. There's ownership there. and Let every woman have her own husband. There's ownership there. Um, and God created us for his purposes and his glory and fellowship and those things. And um, so what, why should we, why should he put up with us going worshiping a stump or a rock or an angel or whatever? Uh, envy, so jealousy, jealousy is actually normal. Uh, now, it can be taken to unrighteous extremes. Someone says hello to your wife and you shoot them. That's, that's probably a little bit over the top, you know? Um, uh, but within a righteous amount, a, a righteous level, jealousy is a good thing. You're jealous over your children. Why? You don't want just anybody watching them. You want someone you trust, that you entrust with them. Um, things like that. Whereas envy is, um, I've always loved Audis, and I, and I drive, I don't even want to say what I drive. <laughs> And James has an Audi. So I could be envious that he has an Audi and I don't. And then covetousness is worse. It's like envy, but it's on steroids. I don't just want one because he has one. I want his, and I don't want him to have it. I want, I want his Audi. I want that person's wife. I want their house. That's covetousness. All right, so those how, are those how the, uh, you distinguish those. And so God doesn't want them... Worshipping him and Malcolm, and you know the priests just getting along, you know, with the with the Baal priests, and we're all in the same. We all believe in one God. We're all going the same place, you know. Uh, maybe they are all going the same place, but if you're in with a inner, you know, all the you know all the different religions, and you're all going to the, wrong, the same place, uh, you, then you ought to get saved because you're going to the wrong place, you know. Uh, you have no business being in that place with them if you're saved. Now, Malcolm, um, uh, go to 2 Kings 21, just for another cross-reference, and then we'll look at Malcolm in 1 Kings. 2 Kings 21. Sorry, I didn't think about that when I was, we were in 23. 2 Kings 21, verse number 3. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah, this is talking about Manasseh, Hezekiah's son, which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. And he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Wow, it seems to be a common habit. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his sons pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the grove which he had made in the house of, the, of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon, his son, in, his, in this house and in Jerusalem, have I, which I have chosen of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever, which is kind of funny. It matches what we were talking about just as the extra this morning in Deuteronomy 16.11. And then go to um, 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings chapter number 11. And verse number 33. You've got a different name of Malcolm. or a couple different names. Uh, verse 3. And he, Speaking of Solomon, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. By the way, a concubine is a second-class wife. If you compare Genesis with 1 Chronicles, uh, you have, after uh, Sarah dies, and Abraham takes uh, Keturah to wife, one place says it's his wife, one place says it's a concubine. So a concubine is basically a a shack up second class wife. Uh, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as it was, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. All right, so Milcom is another name for him, and as we'll see go, as we go on. 
And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. So the abomination of the Ammonites in verse 5 is Milcom, and he's, the abomination of the Ammonites in verse 7 is Molech. So it's all the, it's all the, it's, you have different names, different variations, uh, just like you have Isaiah and Esaias. Okay, you're at different places, different times, different uh, dialects, things like that. The names will be uh, uh, similar, but they're all the same uh, person, all the same God. And that's one of those things people kind of ridiculously say, well, see, that they have different names. And, you know, I know we've talked about it before, but, you know, I, some people call me Bert, some people call me Cog, some people call me, uh, you know, Herb, I, the, the, growing up, everybody called me Bert except the Puerto Ricans. They all called me Herb or Herbs. <laughs> Yo, Herbs, man. And, and, and they didn't know each other. It just, whenever they, they all, they all called me Herb I, or Herbs. You know, why is that? I don't know, but it's my name anyway, you know. Um, so, and then also it's kind of funny how many times these prophets that we've been going through match Hosea. In Hosea chapter 10, You know, we kind of breezed through he Hosea so fast, I figured I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd point this out. <laughs> I have another name for you. <laughs> 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 <Add to> the <laughs> <pile>. <laughs> Hosea 10, verse 5, The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of beth -Avon. for the people thereof shall mourn, mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it, the glory thereof because it departed from it. There you have idolatrous priests. Funny how they keep showing up. Uh, and how the Bible just, as Brother Brown says, is stitched together. It just works in like that, you know. Uh, it's kind of like, the Bible's kind of like the body of Christ. It's fitly framed together. And God puts things exactly where he wants them. Uh, in verse 6, And them that are turned backward from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of him. Uh, Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter number 1. And verse number 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. All right? God uses those same terminologies to, to, so that you don't miss the cross references. Uh, so, you know, Zephaniah says, them that are turned back from the Lord. And Isaiah says, they are gone away backward. Uh, uh, back to Hosea chapter 4. Yes, Hosea is after Daniel, not before. It's funny how I used to know those. <laughs> Hosea 4, verse 16, For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I can't see the word heifer now without thinking of Samson. If you hadn't plowed with my heifer. <laughs> for, for Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. That large place. The Bible is always up to date on language, you know. It's talking about in Matthew he gave him large money. <laughs> you know, when Jesus was in the house, you know, we be brethren, all those things. When I was preaching when he was preaching a long time. Uh, you know, it's just it's got all those things come right out of the Bible, man. <laughs> Especially if you have like a warped mind to notice those things. <clears throat> but in uh, Zephaniah one again, them this is the state of Israel when. Uh, when Nebuchadnezzar shows up, it's the state of Israel when the Antichrist shows up. Yeah. And those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. 
Romans 3, verse 10, very common passage. Now, there are people that sought the Lord. Hezekiah did seek the Lord with all his heart. There actually, if I remember right, about 15, 20 years ago, I went through, I think I found 231 times where people sought the Lord. And yet, in what, in what way? In Romans 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. And God does look down to heaven in different times and says, there's nobody seeking after me. And, of course, in the ultimate sense of salvation today, I don't know if there's an exception or not. Generally, people aren't seeking God. He seeks them out. Maybe he puts it in their heart to, to provoke them. Um, and I don't have all that nailed down. Uh, but these people, they did not seek after God nor inquired of him. Isaiah 34 Isaiah 34. I do remember that's before Jeremiah. Got that one down. <laughs> I might forget tomorrow, but I got it down for today. Um, Isaiah 34, verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate, for my mouth it it hath commanded, and his spirit, it hath gathered them. I know it's a different context, but basically that's God's instruction all the time. Seek you out the word of the Lord and read. Uh, certainly we can apply that to us today. We're saved and everything, but shouldn't we be seeking what the Lord wants, seeking the Lord's will? He's told us what his will is. Seek him, you know, uh, how many times you make a decision because this is what you want to do, and then when it doesn't go right, then you start seeking the Lord. You know, maybe if you seek the Lord first, you'd avoid some of those troubles, and, and read. How do you seek the Lord? Yep. Read. Not, not rocking and science. God's actually made it pretty easy. Um, we just make it difficult. And Zephaniah. Oh, eh, just go to one more. Go to Matthew 6. Go to the kingdom gospel here. Kingdom constitution. People say, well, some things in there don't apply to the kingdom. Yeah, that's true. Some of the things in it are the tribulation to how you get to that kingdom. What, what do you do in preparation while you're waiting for it to show up? It, it's still set up for the kingdom. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. These things are back a few verses. What are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? What are you going to be clothed with all? All that stuff. Okay. So these people did not do that. And these are the people Jesus came and said, hey, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's not what they were seeking back here in Zephaniah. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord. Go back one page, probably a page, maybe half page, two pages, to Habakkuk 2. The last verse of the chapter, I think this is quoted in one of those, by the Antichrist in one of those poltergeist movies or something. Poltergeist films. Well, yes. If I saw it, it was a film. <laughs> Habakkuk 2, verse 20. Well, I heard there was scripture being quoted, so I, I suffered through the movie to watch it. <laughs> But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Uh, I think when you see him, it won't be hard to keep silent. You know, it's kind of like, like what Dave always points out. See God, boom. Including John. John yeah. sat right here uh, with his head right here the night of the Lord's Supper. I mean, you're as John's as close to him as anybody could be. And when he sees him in all his glory, boom, fell at his feet as a dead man. Um, yeah. I, I, but yet it is a command. You know what? When God's talking, what, it's kind of, you know, they have the E.F. Hutton commercials. Yeah, well, some of you probably don't remember those, but it was just financial advisor. 
and their commercial was, you know, you're in this noisy room in a restaurant or whatever, and everybody's carrying on their little conversations, and all of a sudden E.F. Hutton starts to speak at his table, and everybody, how the hell? Everybody stops to listen, because when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Uh, that's how it ought to be when God speaks, and one day it will be, but it ought to be that way now while, we, while, while you have the option, you ought to willingly do so. Um, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He had bid his gifts. Um, I, I guess we, we, prob we were not, not going to look at... Yeah. We'll look at it a little bit. Go to uh, Luke 17. We'll look at a few verses and then we'll stop. Luke 17. And I've heard this preached since I was in elementary school, that this is the rapture of the church right here. A um, couple things wrong with that. The cross hasn't happened. Nobody any knows anything about the body of Christ. And the mystery of the rapture hadn't been revealed to Paul yet. Paul's not, well, nobody's saved in a New Testament sense, but, uh, you know, we haven't gotten to Acts 9 where Paul gets saved, that's for sure. And also, the people are taken Taken is not a good thing in the Bible. And, you know, I don't know of an exception. Maybe there is one. If, it is, if there is one, I would assume the context will explain it. Because uh, when you're taken, it's, it's basically against your will. You really have no choice. You may not mind. You may or may not mind. But you, just, you had no choice. Um, so in verse 35, uh, uh, let's back up. Verse 35. 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. All right. Uh, verse 32, remember Lot, Lot's wife. Verse 35, two men shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be taken in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord? You know, where were they taken? Doesn't say they went up to heaven with, to be with Jesus Christ. He said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Go to Revelation 19. There's actually quite a few references on this. We won't look at, we'll only look at a couple, but there's a lot of references to these birds and their supper. Revelation 19. You have the second coming at the Battle of Armageddon in verse 11. I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in judgment, in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. And for time's sake, we'll skip down to verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. So that is what this sacrifice where God prepares guests. The guests here are the birds um, where, that are going to eat the flesh of all these uh, people that God just wiped out with his word. Um, and then two more passages, Acts 2. Just for a little bit, we're going to look at this more later in the chapter, but just a little bit of the timing because of so much about us going through the tribulation and all that. In Acts 2, you have the day of Pentecost, and, and, and the other reason I want to go is because it shows that they really were still expecting the return of Christ. If Israel had turned, we wouldn't have had to have, the, had to have. We wouldn't have this age of grace. They would have, Daniel's 70 weeks would have just continued and finished. Peter's preaching that. He's preaching out of Joel. Acts 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, which didn't happen back when it, Peter was preaching. He's expecting those things to come. Some of it came, but not this part. The sun shall be 
turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So those things happen before the day of the Lord. And then Matthew 24, and we'll close. When do those things happen? Well, they happen before the day of the Lord. All right, but what about how, how they relate to the tribulation? Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the Son of Man, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and there shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So you have immediately after the tribulation, boom, all these things happen. I know they've been happening during the tribulation, but they happen again right there, boom, before the day of the Lord come, and then there's the day of the Lord when he shows up, and it's a day of wrath and all that. Any questions? All right, we'll, we'll look at that more in detail later in the chapter. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that one day you'll come and you'll destroy your enemies and you'll get the honor and glory due your name. We look forward to you getting that glory. Yeah. We also look forward to you coming for us. Help us be faithful until that time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.